Support for this show and the following message come from StatMed Learning. StatMed Learning tackles various test-taking problems and offers practical, actionable advice to improve your scores via improving your test-taking strategy and helping you overcome common problems that students have when they're taking an exam. Go to thestatprogram.com slash ITB to learn more and to take advantage of a special offer from StatMed Learning just for ITB listeners. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. I am Patrick Beeman, your host. Before we get into today's content, we're here with Ryan Orwig, founder of StatMed Learning, with another StatMed lesson. We're back with Ryan Orwig, founder of the StatMed Learning Platform. To learn more, go to thestatprogram.com slash ITB. All right, Ryan, common specific test-taking issues. People say, I always narrow down to two answer choices, then pick the wrong one. Why does this happen? So I think so many struggling students with boards performance issues, they contact, contact us and say exactly that. I always narrow to two and I always pick the wrong one. Now, part of that could be a knowledge issue, but a lot of the times it's not. It's actually something that's very ingrained in the test taking process where it's what I call the interface where the test, you know, where you're, the, the brain of the, of, the, of the student is sort of interacting and interfacing with the question. So in this case, they're doing something process wise to make this sort of happen. And there are patterns that can explain this. So let's say a student is doing a question that asks, what is the best initial treatment? And then the student reads the, you know, the passage and narrow, then the answer options and narrows down to two. They narrow down to say prednisone and endomethacin, just for an, an example. Let's say prednisone is the wrong answer and endomethacin B is the correct answer. Mm-hmm. So what those, and so the, the reaction with, as they're, as they're looking at these, they, they go with prednisone, that's the wrong answer. And they basically say you know, to themselves, I know a lot about prednisone but I'm not really sure how it fits with this scenario. And then with B, they say, well, endomethacin. Okay, hmm. You know, I think I think this is first line for this situation. It's asking best initial treatment, but they don't, th- th- but then they say, oh, you know, I like it maybe, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to pick A. I know more about A. So all of a sudden, they're not really answering the question being asked. It's almost a referendum on which drug do you know more about, which is terrible. Yeah. And if they were to really break this thing apart, prednisone, back to most best initial treatment, mm, I really don't know, endomethacin, yeah, I think maybe that is the right, that is the first line treatment for this situation. I mean, if you break it down to like sort of an equation like that, endomethacin, you have to pick it 10 times out of 10 in this scenario because it has a better chance of being right based on what the individual knows. But again, this is a kind of pattern that people might experience. Now, I don't care about this scenario with prednisone into medicine. Don't care about that at all. I care about the pattern for the individual. So this is where the student is carrying what I call a binary test taking mentality. This is like an old, it's probably ported over from undergrad where back then you could, all the sort of first order stuff is either you knew it or you didn't know it. They might've been able to turn in a test and like, be like, that is a 93%. Boom. There it is. That is not how this works at this level anymore. It's not going to work like that for the rest of their lives. The good test takers are using the parts of what they know to eliminate wrong choices and choose the best of what's left. Here, endomethasone is better, safer, because at least it connects more with what they know and the scenario. So this is what has to happen. A, a, A bad test taker is probably doing the same two, three, four patterns over and over and over, and they're not changing it because they don't have proper feedback. They're not diagnosing the situation. They're not assessing it after they miss it. And then they're not putting it into play moving forward. The StatMed Boards Workshop 
teaches them how to identify the patterns and then how to put that into action through training and on test day. To learn more and for a special offer from StatMed Learning, go to thestatprogram.com slash ITB. Thanks, Ryan. And now, part two of our renal review for the Inside the Boards Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. A three-year-old girl is brought to the emergency department because of fever, vomiting, and nausea. Physical exam shows a painless abdominal mass that extends from the flank to the midline on palpation. Abdominal ultrasound is obtained and shows that part of the mass extends to the inferior vena cava. Further biopsy indicates blastemal, stromal, and epithelial cells. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, nephroblastic nephroma, B, Noonan syndrome, C, renal cell carcinoma, or D, a Wilms tumor? Take it away. This is a cancer question, unfortunately. It's a, I know the answer is to be that it's a Wilms tumor because it's a painless tumor that's commonly found in children and they commonly have the, I guess, triphasic tumor would be the best term for it, where they have the blasternal cells, the stromal cells, and the epithelial cells all within the same one mass. So that's kind of was my giveaway was the biopsy as well as the fact that it was a painless tumor compared to the other answer choices, which some of them might be painless, like the mesoblastic nephroma tend to be a little bit less painful because they, they're fibroblastic cells and they just create like this mass, but they don't cause as much pain. Whereas with like renal cell carcinoma, that commonly has more signs and symptoms of like hematuria, flank pain, enlarged abdominal mass. But because our patient had both an abdominal mass and it was painless, that kind of cuts out those two answer choices because those are like the two ends of the spectrum. And then that, like I was saying before, leaves us with two other answer choices. And uh, Noonan syndrome, actually, I don't even think is really associated with kidney dysfunction as much. Yeah. It's more so like low set ears, short neck, heart defects, and like musculoskeletal and learning disabilities rather than a kidney disorder that would cause a mass of some form. And the epidemiology will take you really far on this question. You know, knowing that you have an infant, you were thinking more of like a nephroma, you know, in an adult with, like you said, the the flank pain and the enlarging mass, you're, you're thinking more of renal cell carcinoma. And, and kind of in the middle there, you, if you have like a a young child with a, an abdominal mass, you can probably set that into there are two different things that that's going to be right off the top of your head uh, if it's going to be involving the kidney, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, that's either a Wilms tumor, in which case it's uh, well circumscribed, doesn't cross the midline, has this triphasic uh, histology, mm -hmm. you know, a few other things. And then the other one that comes into my mind is a, a neuroblastoma. So a neuroblastoma is going to be a little bit uglier in my mind. It's got more hemorrhaging. It's a little more of an irregular mass. And kind of like in a, in a vignette, they always really touch on the fact that it crosses the midline versus a Wilms tumor, which tends to stay on one side. Now, you know, my point with this question, I actually can make two real good points. Noonan syndrome. Have you heard of Noonan syndrome before? Not, not as much as I mean. It's like one of those things where I'm like, I've heard that for boards questions, but I've never actually seen any patients with it, kind of thing. So, right, it's a congenital disorder. It, you know, I think it kind of works as like a a, a, a nice distractor for a, a question like this. Yeah, it doesn't really apply here, but you know, it sounds nice. Maybe someone would pick it. Who knows? I can't even, I can't find it in first aid. Like that's how important it is for you to know about Noonan syndrome. Okay. And I would encourage you when you're studying, if you see one of these, you know, a, a lot of what they test on the boards might actually be kind of like a unicorn disease, but if it's not even in first aid, then that's a, a special kind of unicorn. And I don't really think it deserves much, if any attention whatsoever, you know? Agreed. Uh, and, and you're, you're not really, you know, who's, who is going to be asking you to differentiate that kind of thing, you know, aside from looking it up in OMIM. 
Mm-hmm. And this is the, it's one of those diseases that it's like a pimping question that like no one knows it, but it's got like distinct features <laughs> enough that an attending who just can think of something off the top of their head will be like, Oh, what's the, what does this patient have if they had these characteristics kind of thing? It's not, yeah, it's not so much a, I'll say a board step one question other than the fact that it's a unique disease. So it makes it so that if like they give you all the details, like the low set ears, short neck, growth defects, heart defects, and learning disability, like they have to give you literally all of those in the question usually before you can be like, oh, it's Noonan syndrome. Right. And there's a big difference between unique diseases that are, that exist and that are, um, testable really Mm -hmm. you could probably draw up a vignette for noonan syndrome but at the same time i I don't know if it's going to be high yield for you to bother right exactly the other thing that i really wanted to touch on is the you know this is the second question where i've really given you these two diseases and you kind of had to pick through them you know the the first one is like the ttp and hus but wilms tumors and neuroblastomas are pretty similar also in that you get a lot of characteristics that overlap between all four of these different, not together, but as a comparison of these two, you get a lot of overlaps Mm -hmm. in both cases. And it kind of draws the point to me that like presuming the boards are going to ask you about something more than just like, what is this diagnosis? Uh, You need to be able to go deeper than you know, just identifying, but identifying is going to get you really far. If you can't figure out what something is, if you're sitting here like, is this a Wilms tumor or a neuroblastoma, you're going to have more trouble going to that next step in the question. So my, my kind of like heuristic here is being able to kind of differentiate between these very similar presentations. Usually when questions are written, they have about you know, seven to 12 different types of data, depending on how you look at them. You know, you think about your age, race, gender, you think about where are they presenting, like at the doctor's office or the emergency room or they're found deceased and, you know, their presentation, what's their, their chief complaint, how long is it happening? What's their actual history, their physical labs, imaging, you know, the whole works, you know, with these overlapping kind of diseases, you can take them and you'll find that a lot of this stuff is very similar, but you need to be able to figure out the compare, you know, how to compare the two. So you're thinking of both of them and then have a way to contrast them, you know, further down the line, kind of like a flow chart where, you know, first off, you're starting with the broad, you know, could it be these two things? And then breaking off once you get that kind of hingeable piece of data to where you're able to clinch a diagnosis and move on to what the question's actually asking you about, right? Agreed. So being able to just take these kind of difficult, comparable diseases and just figure out how to contrast them, you know, I don't really recommend taking a lot of notes, but this is a situation where you really want to want to be able to piece these two out before you, or like during an exam, and you're not going to want to be trying to have, or having trouble figuring that out while you're in the middle of your test, right? Exactly. So it's, that's actually a lot of the diseases that I've noticed in like the board studying and in first aid is a lot of them are like, for example, ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's. There's, they're both GI diseases. They both have very similar presentations and symptoms. It's just like the key differences between them. And if you know those key differences well enough, it makes questions about those diseases so much easier and so much more quick. So I'd say if you can find diseases that look similar and have like similar presentations, always try and figure out what those key differences between them are and then just memorize those. Cause if you know, everything else is the same, it's a lot less to memorize and it's a lot easier to pick out the key fact when you're doing the actual question. Exactly. And you know, we, these kind of tests like really try to emphasize those differences, but no, you know, knowing the whole picture too gives you a good jumping off point. Cause if you read one of these and didn't know if you weren't sure if it could, it was even like a, an ulcerative colitis versus a Crohn's, then you're going to have a lot of trouble moving forward mm-hmm. uh, to those like differences in the, uh, you know, histology or the progression or their risk factors for cancer and things that are going to be that next order that you have to go to. All right. All right. Last question here. It looks like we have a 38 year old woman 
comes to the office because of ongoing urinary frequency, urgency, and dysuria. The patient's medical history includes recurrent UTIs, with about four to six of them happening each year for the last three years. She says her symptoms typically resolve with antibiotic use, but will return once she stops using these antibiotics. Your analysis is performed and shows the following. So for pH, it's a pH of 9. There is 0 grams of protein in the urine. There is no glucose or blood in the urine. There are 15 to 20 white blood cells in the urine. Leukocyte esterase is positive, and there are less than 5 epithelial cells in the urine. And lastly, there is no bacteria present within the urine. So, given this information, which of the following is the most likely underlying cause of this patient's recurrent urinary tract infections? A, a colovesticular fistula. B, neurogenic bladder. C, struvate kidney stones. Or D, vesicourinary reflux. All right. So, what I what I'm picking out from this question is we have a patient who gets a UTI and gets treated and it goes away. And then as soon as they stop their antibiotics, it comes back and they go back and forth and sort of ping pong here. My first thought with that is either you don't actually have an infection, you're just kind of believing you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's some sort of nidus where you're allowing, even after treatment, you're allowing the bacterial pathogen to reemerge, right? Now, characteristically here on the labs, you noted that the pH is 9. That is really alkaline. That is two orders of magnitude less hydrogen ions than a normal, you know, a neutral solution, right? So that that's a lot less than you would expect. Mm-hmm. There are only a handful of things that can cause your pH to go up that high. And to me, you know, I think of like urease producing bacteria, mm-hmm. you know, the two that come to my mind immediately are Proteus and Helicobacter, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Helicobacter is probably not a, a good option here because that's more of like a peptic ulcer involvement, but a Proteus organism could cause urea splitting and the formation of these triple phosphate kind of stones, which also have the characteristic name of struvite stones that would provide a nidus for your infection to seek refuge during an antibiotic treatment and still sort of reemerge after the discontinuation of the antibiotics. So that would be my answer for this question. And that would be the correct answer. It is indeed struvate kidney stones. And you were right to focus on the pH. Um, that's a very easy thing to latch on to and to help you figure out this answer. But another thing that is key here that isn't as obvious is the fact that there is an absence of bacteria. So if you were having a colovesicular fistula, that's a connection between the bowels and the bladder, you would be having bacteria present because you would have fecal urea and pneumaturia and you would have these, because there's the connection between the bowels and the bladder, you would have positive bacteria and you would have other things present in the urine that aren't currently present. And then to go through the other two answer choices, you wouldn't have a neurogenic bladder. While that could cause some of her symptoms, like the frequency, it wouldn't cause urgency or they wouldn't even feel the urge to urinate because of the damage to the neurological system. But also we don't have any history of this patient having a neurological injury so you kind of can just eliminate that answer off the bat because that you would have to make the assumption that they have a neurological injury for that even to be the correct answer. And the questions never have you assume anything, or they're not supposed to at least, have you assume anything unless it's explicitly stated in the question. And then lastly, the vesiculourinary reflex, you're going to be having, that's when you have the incompetent valves in the urethrovesicular system. So this can lead to reflux and lead to re- uh, common infections and like hydronephrosis. But because this patient's pH is 9, which is really high, that makes you more likely to think that it's like a proteus organism causing these struvate kidney stones, like you said. 
Oh yeah, and, and the the reflux is you know key for something like hydronephrosis mm-hmm. or like uh, pyelonephritis and that kind of situation. But that's not really you know what we're we're not really seeing like a progressing UTI here. Mm-hmm. We're seeing a recurring UTI. So that kind of guides me in a little bit of a different direction. But you, you know, while that could cause the recurrent infections, if you had a, a kidney infection, like you said, the the pH wouldn't necessarily be off. You know, you would think if you had a colovesicular fistula, you would have more like your anaerobic bacteria kind of getting in there and fecal urea. I'm trying to think of other, so some other urease producing organisms could include Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Pseudomonas, but they don't characteristically make these magnesium, ammonium, phosphate stones that Proteus is known for. And these are like the staghorn calculi that you can probably all picture just uh, in your head, right? Yeah, and... From, again, from hospital experience here, I've seen a few patients that have had these giant struvate staghorn calculi, and oh boy, are they painful. So I do not, I do not wish this on anyone, especially on a 38-year-old woman, because it is, those hurt quite a bit. I think they could cause, you know, they do cause flank pain, Mm -hmm. Uh, the recurrent infections, obvious. Do they do, can they make any, have any other complications that you can think of? Uh, Well, I mean, as with anything, you can have like hydronephrosis because of the kidney stone blocking up the flow of urine out of the body. You can also, in some like extreme cases, I've seen at least, we had one patient who had one of these struvate kidney stones that was so big that it was actually like making the kidney grow in a size, so to speak. And because it had grown and blocked off so much, and I I will caveat this for everyone, even my attending had only, like, this was the first time they'd ever seen this kind of thing happen, is that it had grown so big that she was actually, like, starting to cut off her kidney's blood supply because the stone was just compressing everything so much. But again, this is this was like a... 65-year-old diabetic woman who didn't take care of herself, didn't, like, care about her hemoglobin A1C, and had already, like, completely destroyed her kidneys anyways. So a little bit of a different story. So the best of us. Happens to the best of us. Yeah. The sugars. <laughs> the diabetes. So uh, uh, do, you, do you know how, how do you manage that kind of thing? Do you know? Well, so... Do you cut that out or just dissolve it with, like, um, a drug? <laughs> Well, it depends on like the size and what other symptoms the patient's having. Usually with kidney stones overall in general, if they're less than about I'm gonna say like four millimeters, they can they tend to pass on their own with like supportive therapy. So like giving the patient an alpha blocker and giving them a lot of fluids, and they can usually pee out the smaller kidney stones. Once they start getting to the size of around like ten millimeters, that's when you start talking about doing the consulting urology and having them either do the uh, ultrasound-based shock therapy kind of stuff where they just, like, break up the stone with sonic waves. Or even in those cases, like, if it's bigger than that, that's not always the best method. So sometimes they have to actually, if it's even bigger than that, just go in and do an actual surgery and, like, cut open the kidney or cut open the ureter and actually pull the stone out themselves or make a shunt and put and like leave the stone in but make a shunt around it so that the urine can keep going and then do some other stuff to help try and reduce the size of it and help get rid of it wow that seems pretty cool to me but yeah i think that pretty well covers it don't you think yeah i think so um this was fun all right vaguely remember yeah, most really, of this actually yeah and i i really appreciate it and i hopefully it helps uh both of our boards study a little bit to just kind of talk through some of this and yeah, good luck on your uh, dedicated period. Yeah, you too. Hopefully I'll be just as fortunate. Yeah, hopefully hopefully we'll both be done with boards in the near future and both crush it because of all this studying we've been doing together and hopefully just go on from there to rotations and you can find out for yourself what patients with crazy kidney stones looks like. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited for that, so cannot lie. All right, well, I'll talk to you a bit later. All right, I'll talk to you later. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. And we will end it there. 
Thank you for listening. Thanks to Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track Anesthetist off the 2015 album The Mind Sweep. We'll see you back next week for some more high yield learning. <laughs>